I love doing building projects. Uh, when I get started with them anyway, usually they're a to-do item on my list that I put off for a long time. But once I get going on the building project, I enjoy it. And over the years, um, what I usually do is I just get all the materials and then I just dig into it and get started, even if I don't know what I'm doing, because I figure I'll figure it out as I go. And uh, how many guys do that? Oh yeah. And it's fun. I mean, when you discover how to do it, it's great. But sometimes you have to tear down stuff you built because you didn't do it right the first time. Um, it's all part of the pride thing, right? You know, we don't like to ask for directions and stuff. But um, the fun is discovery. Now, a great tool that I've learned to use over the years now that I use, that I use now is YouTube. I like to go to YouTube and I watch how a carpenter or somebody that knows what they're doing does the project and I'll watch like three, four, five videos on different people in their method and why their method's the best method. You know, of course, everybody has a different idea of how to do it sometimes, but, um, and then work out my plan based on that. And the great thing is it's led to me having a lot less rebuilds, a lot less after I'm done looking at the project going, well, there's that part. I hope nobody sees, you know. Um, but those evident mistakes come when we don't know what we're doing. So I've learned that new way of referring to the master builders, you know, those that know what they're doing. Hearing about the possible mistakes before I actually make them and then proceeding once I hear from the experts. And, you know, overall, changing the quality of the project and my knowledge, you know? So Paul today, he tells us to be careful how we build when it comes to the church. The church, when we talk about building the church, I'll just say this right off the bat, we're not talking about a building um, or a cathedral or a temple, we're talking about the people. Uh, the church, the word refers to a group of people, not to a structure, though Paul uses a structure as an illustration for the people. And so Paul tells us, be careful how we build. Be careful how ministry is done in the church from leaders and what they do and teach, but also every Christian with their spiritual gifts, how they use them to build up the body of Christ. The quality of our work the quality of our ministry to one another matters. And so ministry ultimately matters. It's just not something you, you fill um, a slot in a schedule. Um, you know, what you do on Sunday morning, what you do in your small groups, what you do uh, in your relationships and fellowship with one another, it matters much more than we oftentimes realize at the time. Now, we have something better than YouTube to help us out, which is good. You know, we have the Word of God. We have within it examples of master builders like Paul, like Peter, like the apostles, like the prophets um, that show us, and ultimately the master builder, Jesus Christ, where we can watch their example and follow in their footsteps. We also have a great resource the Holy Spirit who empowers us and indwells us so that when Paul says, be careful how you build, you have everything you need, all the resources at your disposal in order to be careful. In Corinth, Paul, since chapter one, has been in the context of dealing with division. And so as we talk about the, the building structure, apparently the building has some major cracks, some uh, foundational settling that's causing it to be wonky, you know? The division in the body. And so he began that in chapter one, and in this teaching that we see today is also within the context of division in the body. And so Paul spurs us on towards unity with three descriptive illustrations one which we saw last week, 
where he said, you are God's field. You know, I planted, Apollos watered. Everybody has their job, and then ultimately it's God that causes the growth. Today, we're going to be looking at the second illustration, that we are God's building. And next week, that we are God's temple. But as we look at this building illustration, we pursue unity in that Paul challenges leaders to do ministry God's way, not their way. So the church isn't being divided by leaders or who's following a leader, but rather leaders following Christ and making him the focus. We're unified in Jesus, but also revealing unhealthy leaders with that cheap building material so that we, as believers, would be able to be discerning in who we listen to, who we follow. Now, as we go into verse 10, we see the first point, that Jesus is the true foundation for ministry. He says, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. I love how Paul sees his own ministry as a grace from God. Paul doesn't say this ministry that I've worked to earn my position. Paul says it's by the grace of God that I'm in this role of apostle to the Gentiles. The reality is no leader deserves their role. It's only by the grace of God. God called Paul when Paul was a self-righteous Pharisee that was persecuting the church of God. He was imprisoning and putting to death Christians. This is the guy Paul called to be a leader. Um, And over Paul's life as an apostle, you see this realization of God's grace in his life He was very well aware of it from the beginning, but I think the way it penetrated his heart was deeper over time because you see in his writings earlier on, he he calls himself the least of the apostles, um, which is still a pretty high state, right? To be least of the apostles, hey, (laughs) that would be really cool to be in that number, right? But then later as he matures, he then says, I'm least of all the saints. I'm least of all the Christians, all the believers. And then the last part of his life, he calls himself the worst of sinners. You know, that realization, when you mature in your relationship with God of just how much dependent on God's grace you actually are, um, becomes more real. It penetrates deeper. And so God gave him this grace to be an apostle. He gave him wisdom and skill in founding the church in Corinth and a a bunch of churches. And so when he talks about himself being a skilled expert builder, we might miss this because of translations, but the word skilled is literally the word wise. The Corinthians wouldn't have missed the connection um, where he's been talking about in this book so far about the wisdom of man versus the wisdom of God. And so Paul saying that he's a wise master builder, he's building with the wisdom from God, not his own. The word expert builder is a master workman or builder. Not just a contractor, but someone who not only lays out the plans, but engineers it and covers all of the technical aspects, um, the vast knowledge that goes into a project. Um, Nowadays, we might break things up into engineers and architects and contractors and builders and all these different things. But Paul says, I was a master builder. That's where we get our word, our modern word, architect. Architect. The first part of that word meaning rank or degree and tecton meaning builder. 
Now, in that day, it was recorded that you could buy a carpenter to do a project for about 600 drachmas, which you all know what those are probably, right? But like pieces of silver, if you will. But you would need more than 10,000 drachmas to hire a master builder. So that's how important they were in those days. The guys that would oversee the building of those Greek column buildings that still stand today, some of them. Some of those temples that they built to other gods and things required these master builders. And so did the temple that was in Jerusalem. You know, first Solomon's temple, then that was destroyed, and, and then the second temple was built. And Herod spent a lot of time um, constructing the facade and the outside of that second temple to make it a glorious one. It all required master builders. And so the apostles were appointed by God for the special role of laying the foundation for the church. And ever since then, every leader, every pastor, every evangelist, every church participant has been building on the foundation that had already been laid. Now, in Ephesians 2.19, it says, So then you are not, no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And here it is, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone. On any foundation that's built with those huge slabs of stone, there is laid down at the very beginning of the project a cornerstone, which is aligned perfectly to the right angles that need to be there for the building, and it's perfectly flat, and level, and that was what Paul is saying in Ephesians. That's Jesus. He was the first stone laid down. And every other stone finds its angle and its level from that one stone, the cornerstone. Now, Paul laid that foundation, and he says, now someone else is building upon it. And so the apostles drew out the blueprint and set up the foundation, and now we build according to the plan. We don't come in with our own ideas, but rather we look at the master builder's plan, which we can find in Scripture. And that's why Paul says, take care how you build. And this is really the thrust of this first section, take care how you build. This word take care means to have the faculty of sight. So literally it means just look. Here it has the figurative meaning of watching carefully, paying close attention and watching out for hazards. So take care how you build. Look very carefully, watch out, beware of those mistakes people often make so that you can build well. In Galatians 6.1, we see the same word used when it says, brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. And here's the same word for take care. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. So watch out for those temptations, those traps those mistakes. And so if we're to take care in how we build, we keep our eyes open. We ask the Lord to show us the blind spots in our ministry, maybe to reveal wrong motivations that we wouldn't fall to the common shipwrecks that leaders have faced throughout the centuries. The big three. Maybe you've heard this before. The big three temptations is to steal God's glory or take God's money or mess with God's women. 
The three great temptations for Christian leaders, for pastors. And leaders are to take care of how they build. Build upon that foundation, Jesus Christ. And so, um, a church can be built on a lot of different things. You know, if people put a church in an area and say, hey, we're going to be a, a church that is built upon social justice, or we're going to be a church that is built upon accepting everyone, or uh, whatever it may be. But Scripture says very clearly, if you're going to build a church, you build it on Jesus Christ, in Him first. And if you have a heart for social justice, if you have a heart for sinners of all sorts, then, you know, Jesus will be the cornerstone that will direct you in the right way to approach those things. But when you build the church on a different foundation, you can be sure that it's going to be all messed up. And so we build a church not on a pastor. We don't build a church on a theological position on non-essential issues. We don't build a church on a certain mystery or a ministry method. We build the church on Jesus Christ. And so that means we build the church on the teachings of Christ and on the practices of Christ. We see uh, him teach through scripture. The best way to do this is like what Paul told Timothy. You know, if you want to keep the church founded on Christ, set at the right angles and at the level, then do this. In 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, enduring, suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. You know, for me, there's no better way than to keep things founded on Christ than to, to stay in his word and preach Christ through his word. And as we know, if the church is built on the teaching or tradition of men, then those builders build in vain. In verse 11, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Presenting Christ through the scriptures, looking at his true identity, presenting him as God in the flesh, and looking at his true nature and character, Teaching Christ by sharing his commands, his teachings, the gospel that he preached. Also, we present Christ by talking about his work, his example that he set for us, his atonement on the cross, his resurrection and ascension, his ministry to us even now. Um, But there's no room on the platform with Jesus for another savior. There's no room on the platform with Jesus for another pastor. Jesus is the one and every other leader is an underling, but he is the one. He is the only savior. In Acts 4.12, it says, and there is salvation in no one else. No one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Only the name of Christ. All of us must be saved because we're all sinners. We've all fallen astray. And it's only through Christ we have access to the Father. If we're to present Christ and lay him as the foundation of the church, it also means preaching the the right gospel. Scriptures are deadly serious about preaching the gospel correctly. In Galatians 1.8, it says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel 
contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed, which is a pretty harsh word. It means uh, eternally condemned. Let him be in, um, condemned. So what is that gospel? Well, it is the gospel of grace. The gospel that it's by faith in Jesus Christ that we receive salvation, not by works, not by our own righteousness, but by Jesus in him alone, faith alone, grace alone, you know? And so that's the foundation. And so ministry should be based on those things. And that's why we're talking about today, ministry matters. How you do it really matters. So make sure our church um, and your ministry and everything that goes on in every life group and every Sunday school class is built on that foundation of Jesus Christ. In verse 12, we see a second point, that God tests the quality of your service. One day, he will test, not whether you did it or not, but how you did it, the quality In verse 12, now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Ministry that is quality costs you something. And this is a hard thing, oftentimes, for those going into serving in a ministry, is we want it to be easy. And I can say that from personal experience. You know, I want to wake up on Sunday morning and come to church and have it be easy. (laughs) I don't want to face trials and troubles and, and have to work really hard. That's the flesh. But oftentimes, though, ministry that costs you something is the ministry that's quality where we make sacrifice, where we do that word we talked about last week, we labor, which actually makes you exhausted, (laughs) tired. Um, But in 2 Timothy 2, 3 through 7, I love how Paul talks about ministry that costs you something. It's kind of like this. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, but since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. And it's the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give understanding in everything. What a cool way to give that illustration of doing ministry that costs you something. Serving as a soldier, It's not easy. It costs you something. Serving as a medal-winning athlete isn't easy. Ask any of the Olympic winners. Anybody who's even competing in the Olympics, they've made a lot of sacrifices. They've worked really hard. And then also the hardworking farmer. Farming is not for sissies. You know, that's hard work. So if you want your ministry to be quality, realize that it's not going to be just some quick and easy thing. The quality of our building corresponds to the quality of the building materials here. It says, Paul talks about quality building materials, calling it gold, silver, costly stones. Now, all these materials are durable. That means they're going to last a really long time. If you're gonna build something that's gonna last a really long time, usually it costs more money. (laughs) If you've ever done a project, you know all about this. Uh, Usually it costs more money, and usually it takes longer than the quick fix, you know? Ikea furniture is really made uh, to last for a short amount of time, at least every piece I've ever had. I mean, if you've got a piece that lasts more than a couple years, then good on you, because that hasn't worked for me that way. If you want it to be durable, it's going to be more expensive than Ikea. Like the Greek temples, like the stone buildings that were built with granite and marble and beautiful white 
limestone. That's what Paul's talking about. Those kind of buildings that were built to last. Now, this doesn't mean every church we build literally ought to be made out of those things, mind you. (laughs) What we're talking about are the people. What we're talking about are the living stones. The church is made up of the people. And so all the building, all the investment is put into the lives of the people. Not into the beauty of the building, not into that sort of thing, which it's probably good to build a church as best you can, but realize it will burn one day. (laughs) Won't always be there, but we will always be there. So if you're going to do durable ministry, you got to do it with the durable things, you know? Which means if we do durable type of ministry, costly ministry, quality ministry. It starts in your heart towards God because all motivations flow from your heart towards God. So that means it starts with loving and serving God, not man. It means being a man or a woman of prayer The way I like to put it is the secret to success is success in the secret place. The secret to success is success in the secret place, you know, and Jesus talks about that. If you pray, you know, we're not told not to pray publicly, but if you do, make sure the secret place is the primary place of your prayer, where that is the most real, vibrant aspect of prayer before you get up in front of anybody and pray. Same thing in ministry, before you teach kids, before you greet at the door, before I get up and preach the word, whatever it may be, that the sanctity of that secret place, my heart towards God, is vital. Then, A right heart with God flows out to a right heart with others, you know? We do ministry because we love other people, not because we want to be noticed. We lay aside our own rights for the rights of others, just as Jesus did. We make disciples of Jesus, not of ourselves. So here are some verses that talk about what does it look like to do durable quality ministry? In 1 Peter 5, when Paul's talking to the leaders of the church, he says this, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly. You know, have you ever met a leader that is serving willingly? You can tell. Smile on their face. You know, know, know that they see you, they hear you, and they care about you. Um, and then as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Which how many shepherds have you ever seen with a whip driving the people forward? You know, it's just not the way shepherds lead. Shepherds get out in front and they lead them out. It's a good pastor. They lead them back into safekeeping and They don't drive them from behind. 2 Timothy 2.15, if you're going to do quality work, it says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. You know, really getting into the word and interpreting it rightly. So that when you present it to people, it's not your ideas with scripture popped in there, but rather the scripture that forms our ideas, you know. Um, And that's what we strive for at Calvary. If you've noticed, you know, we take the Bible and we teach it. (laughs) That's our goal. In 1 Timothy 4.16, when Paul is instructing a young pastor, Timothy, how to do quality, durable ministry, he says this. 
Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Notice how Paul doesn't let us off the hook for just having the right answers. We also have to have a life that is in alignment with the truth. Quality teaching is backed up by a quality life. Now, that doesn't mean any of us are perfect, but, you know, you should be practicing what you preach, obviously, and even unbelievers know that's a good thing. (laughs) Don't deceive yourself and start thinking once people like what you say that you're actually doing what you're saying. It doesn't translate that way. But if you live it out first, it's interesting how the Lord gives you patience with other people because you've had to work through it yourself. And you know how imperfect you are. And God's done a lot to get you to the place you are to be able to teach what you're teaching and have a life that backs it up. Well, in 2 Corinthians 1.12, Paul also reveals this about his quality ministry. Look at this. He says, for our boast is this. We had an awesome podcast and cool graphics, sweet website, smoke, lasers. No, I'm kidding. For our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience. So when they look at their ministry, they're able to say, you know what, I don't, I don't feel guilty about how I did it. That we behaved in the world with simplicity in godly sincerity. And they weren't putting forth a front to impress people. It was the simple truth, sincerity in godliness, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God and supremely so towards you. Which this is a refreshing verse if you've been in a place that is all about the exteriors. You know, to get back to the heart of it all, Uh, That's what Paul is presenting. And man, that is a great message for our culture, our Christian culture today. People are hungry for just simplicity and sincerity, just the truth, just Jesus. But the temptation is when you want to build fast and you want to build something that looks great to use things, materials that are cheaper and easier put up. And so that's why he talks about wood, hay, or straw. These things are perishable materials. Um, We can do ministry in a way that is very surfacey. Now, a few years back when we drove Abby to Bible college, we made a little stop at Universal Studios. Who's been to Universal Studios? It is so cool. I I love going there and see the dancing transformer, Bumblebee and all that stuff. And uh, (laughs) Jurassic Park, uh, animatrons and all these things. But we went on what was called the VIP experience. And so we got a special experience of being on a smaller bus and and when they would take us back into those um, movie set neighborhoods, um, they would point out the different houses. Like, oh, that house was in this movie and that house was in this movie. And I was seeing my childhood 80s movies right before my eyes. And um, then there were a lot of current shows and stuff they were using some of those facades for, but they let us get off the bus and walk through the houses which you think would be cool, but it really was not. Because once you got through the front door, you look around and it, everything's plywood. And there's actually no house there. There's just a superstructure to hold up the front, the facade. So when you're driving down, you're like, wow, what a beautiful neighborhood, you know? And then you go inside and you're like, whoa, okay, nobody can live in this place. Fake facades. And then they took us into the warehouses where they had all the props for all these movies. And we got to see all these neat little things from a bunch of different movies, you know. Um, I won't go into everything, but, you know, we saw some of the 
ET bodies that they used, we, you know, for ET, and we, we saw um, various things that I had recognized from a lot of different movies. And the funny thing is, when you're up close looking at it, it looks like junk. You know, it's rubber, it's foam, it's made out of household appliances and parts and things. And in the movies, it always looks so cool. But in reality, there wasn't much to it. Now, it's possible that we can fall into doing ministry that way. That it's all about the appearance and the experience, but when it gets down to it and you get through the front door and you look back, you realize there's really not a lot of substance. There's not a lot of life. Um, and so the ministry ends up being more about the perishable things, the smoke, the mirrors, the dog and pony show, the pride of the people, selfishness, greed, competition, jealousy, strife. And I can say those things having experienced them myself at different points in my life, doing ministry, which seems weird and wicked, really, when you talk about it and think about it, but I've struggled with it. Chances are you have too. The desire to put up the facade, the thin veneer over that which we know is just not as mature as we make ourselves out to be. Well, when it comes to ministry, we want to do it with that godly sincerity, with the simplicity of Jesus in his word. Because one day, Paul says, everything will be laid bare. There will be a fire that will rip through that street in Universal Studios and everybody will see it was just plywood, you know? But in a similar way, there will be a day that Paul calls the day in which everything will be exposed. When we stand before Jesus at what's called the Bema Seat Judgment, we will give an answer for how we lived our lives, but also how we did our ministry. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, check this out. It says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And though this passage primarily speaking to Christian leaders, it's also applicable to anybody using their gifts to build up the body but also every believer. Because Paul says we must all appear before this judgment seat. One day, our lives will be examined. It will be exposed. Now that when I talk about the Bema seat judgment, it sounds really weird. Um, and it's kind of funny. I, I did notice one time a toilet had the little insignia that said Bema on it. I was like, oh, that's really funny, dudes, you know, whoever did that. But the Bema seat, it, it, it was a seat in which a ruler would sit in a city. And the, the seat was on top of stairs. So stairs would go up from all sides to this seat or kind of like a throne. And a leader would sit there. And what would happen is anybody that competed in the, the games, the in Corinth, the Isthmian Games were a big deal, kind of like the Olympic Games today. And if somebody was a victor in a race, or wrestling, or boxing, or whatever it is, they would ascend those steps, and the leader would give the reward, which usually was a wreath that was put on their head. It was more about the the glory than the value of the leaves that the wreath was made of. But it was a place of reward. This will happen to every believer. But here the context being ministry is that our ministries, our churches will be revealed by fire, which doesn't mean, you know, God's going to set every church on fire or something, but rather symbolically. Fire is symbolically um, 
refers to purification or judgment. Um, so the fire, it says here, will test each person's work. And so this testing, this revealing by fire, will happen off in the future. But for now, you know, it's not our job to do that to each other. And Paul says, it's not even my job to do that to myself because I'm biased towards myself, you know? So I need to stay faithful to what God's called me to and not worry about judging others or myself. And so in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, it says, therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time. Before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Man. So even the righteous things done, even ministries done, it, we'll find out what the motivation was behind it. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Wow. Now, that second point encourages us to build with quality materials then. If, if we're going to give answer to it one day, if it's going to be tested one day, then, wow, we better take time to do it right. And that'll cost you, but it also requires patience. So don't try to rush good ministry. Don't try to rush yourself as you grow. Take time to actually grow instead of trying to put off the front that you're growing let it be a reality first. Now, in verse 14 and 15, the last two verses we're looking at today, we see the third point, that your legacy has an impact on your eternity. This is heavy stuff. But just because it's heavy doesn't mean the Bible doesn't deal with it, you know? We need to hear these sorts of things. It says, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, survives that fire, uh, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Now understand that this passage is speaking to those who are already saved. So this judgment that we await is not one of heaven or hell. It's for those on their way to eternity with the Lord. But there are two possible outcomes for believers. One is that when God holds a match to that which we built and some things might burn off, but what's left behind says a lot about the quality of our work, then if what we built survives, we will receive our reward, it says. So, um, this word reward is interesting. It, it means payment in accordance with what a person deserves based on the quality of the work completed. In that day, builders received their payment after the project was done, which you would hope that would be the case today, but it's not always, unfortunately. Um, but when it is, there, there's a motivation to do it well, to do it right. In 1 Corinthians 3.8, it says, He who plants and he who waters are one, but in each will receive his wages according to his labor. And that's how God rewards, according to how we built, how we did ministry, how we live for him. So what is going to be the reward? Have you ever thought about that? What, what can you be rewarded with in heaven? I mean, if you've got eternal life, that's... It's pretty awesome. And all the promises of God and everything that we have as believers, um, you know, that would be enough, right? But scripture tells us of a reward. In some cases, the reward is talked about as being greater responsibility. Um, in Matthew 25, 21, it says, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant, you have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much, enter into the joy of your master. Greater responsibility. You've been faithful with this little bit, but I'm going to give you so much more because you've proven yourself. 
Part of it also is going to be commendation from God. 1 Peter 5, 4 says, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. There will be reward, there will be glory when those leaders serve under the chief shepherd and represent him well. Also, one of the great rewards is going to be seeing your work endure. Seeing those people you shared Christ with who have gotten saved, they're with you. Seeing the people that you have discipled, that you have invested in, receive their reward. But there will be those that because they did ministry in a haphazard way, in a a non-costly way, in a thin veneer sort of way, will suffer loss, it says here. This word to suffer loss means to financially be financially penalized by losing one's full payment. Kind of like if somebody built a, did a building project and they messed up and they were fined and lost all of their profits. Um, That's what it's speaking of. You know, somebody could enter heaven as one escaping through the flames. We might be saved, but we'll get there by the skin of our teeth, if you will, or smelling like smoke, if you will, you know, whatever phrase you want to put it. So it is interesting, though, isn't it, that our legacy here has an impact on our eternity. What that will totally look like, I have no idea. But it's a heavy truth that we need to be aware of. Now, Matthew 6, 20 tells us this. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. For where neither moth nor rust destroy... And where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Are you living your life like that? That your reward is not how many people clap for you, not how well people speak of you, but being faithful to what God's called you to, whatever that may be. How do you wish to enter eternity? How do you wish your legacy to be remembered in eternity? Well, it helps to be running the right race. Uh, There's a story of a world-class runner that was invited to compete in a race in Connecticut. So one morning, on the morning of the race, she drove from New York City, following the directions, or so she thought she was, that was given to her over the telephone. On her way, she got lost, and so she stopped at a gas station and asked for help. Where's that race at? And so she knew the race started in a parking lot in the shopping mall, so the guy at the the, um, gas station told her exactly where a race was happening in a shopping mall, and so she went there. She arrived, and she was like relieved to see the parking lot with a decent amount of people, and Runners preparing to compete. It just wasn't as big as she was expecting, but hey, she was ready. You know, she she got her number. They didn't have a record of her entry, but they're like, well, if you hurry up and put on this number, you you can make it before the gun goes off. So she did. But when she crossed the finish line, she came in four minutes ahead of the first male runner only to realize that she had run the wrong race. She wasn't with other world-class runners. Now, do we sometimes in our lives get caught up running the wrong race? We're running the race of fame. We're running the race of size and money and 
success according to the world standards, but, you know, God has a, a different race. And so how do we make sure we're running the right race? How do we know that we're building and are careful how we're building with quality materials? Well, first, here's the application for today. We bring it into our lives, you know, getting some perspective. Number one, set aside perishable pursuits in your ministry. And I think it just starts by praying, God, show me anything that I'm doing where I have a blind spot. You know, it says look carefully, but maybe I've been missing some part of the project. And instead of getting down the road and realizing it was built with the wrong materials, you know, to see it now and address the situation. Examine your life, examine your motivations, examine what you're doing for the Lord. Ponder, you know, am I I doing this so that somebody says thank you? Am I ticked off when somebody doesn't say thank you? (laughs) You know, that's a good test too. Will I keep doing it if nobody notices? Well, if God notices, it is well worth it. When you were working with other people, are you a I-it communicator or a I-they communicator? An I-it communicator is the person on the other side of the conversation is an object and you're talking at them and maybe you're looking over them and you don't see them, you don't hear them. Or an I-they type of ministry where it's you and an actual person that you listen to and you look them in the eye and you invest in them as a person. I've noticed in ministry when I've been doing things that are more perishable, that people become objects or people become distractions. I forget the people are the ministry. So maybe you can relate. Maybe you've been there. You know, it's easy to fall in that as parents, as a boss at work, (laughs) you know, in your marriage, whatever it may be. And instead, invest in quality work, number two. Invest in quality work that endures in your ministry. You know, one of the reality checks for me was when I had cancer and I was going through the bone marrow transplant and I thought I might never come back to the church. And I was thinking things like, I might never see the ocean again. I might not live in my own house again. But one of the thoughts that went through my mind is the way that I did ministry, will I be ready to meet the Lord and give an answer for it? Will I be pleased? Will the Lord be pleased? Am I okay with how things have gone? Man, that was a reality check. Sometimes God gives us those ahead of time so that we can get it right now so that it will be right then. And this passage, perhaps, for you is that. Or maybe you can relate with me. You've had one of those huge life experiences that make you really stop and think. I was faced with the reality of, you know, what really matters? What is gonna really make the difference in my time here on earth? And, you know, the fun thing was coming back from that, you know, not only seeing the family again, living in my own house again, and seeing the ocean again, but being at church again and saying, you know what? All the stuff that used to bother me, all this pride, the pride games, the worries, Man, I could care less now. (laughs) I don't even have to be a pastor. I don't care. I just want to serve the Lord, you know? But it's funny. The longer I've been back, the more those old temptations have been knocking at my door. Sometimes we see it so clearly, but then we get in the woods, and it's hard to see the bigger picture again. So we have to stop and think, you know, am I 
really doing what's going to last? Am I doing what's going to matter? That it's about the people, not the things. It's about what the Lord thinks, not what man thinks. It's about sharing the gospel and making disciples, not building buildings and, you know, a beautiful facade. And sometimes what God has for us is not as glorious as we want for ourselves on this earth. Sometimes it comes down to being faithful with the little things. And that's where he says, well done. You've been faithful with a little. Now you'll be entrusted with much. Whatever it is that God has entrusted you with, don't despise small things. You know, invest fully. Don't despise the people that are right in front of you. They're the ones that are going to last for eternity, you know. And so, ministry matters. Well, why don't we close in prayer? Lord, we come before you as a church, and we long to be a church that lives in simplicity and godly sincerity that is built upon you, Jesus, as the cornerstone. That you would be the foundation of everything that we're about in our own lives and in the message we preach and the life that we live in the ministries we do. Help us to connect people to you wherever we are. And Lord, as we come in a passage like this, sometimes it's kind of heavy. Sometimes there's regret or maybe shame or whatever it is. Lord, we've all been there. And we just lay those things before you that have been a waste of time, things that have been worthless pursuits, and we confess them to you right now. Lord, teach us a new way. Teach us your way. Help us to be those that are willing to pay the price, to count the cost, to build with quality materials. And Lord, as we go out from this place, that your spirit would empower us and encourage us to walk according to your ways. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.